Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be reading to you from this book about the Kingdom of Benin in West Africa. It's kind of a long book, so I'll show you what we're going to read. We're going to read this chapter, Benin, A Story of Glory and Suffering, Chapter 2, Kingdom of Brass and Ivory, and Chapter 3, Gods, Spirits, Ghosts, and the Oba. The rest of the book is very interesting, but I feel like this is like the core knowledge if you really want to get to know this really interesting kingdom. These are the chapters to read. So let's just dive right in and start with chapter one, Benin, a story of glory and suffering. And we're going to read with the pointer pencil too. 500 years ago, the kingdom of Benin outshone all others on the west coast of Africa. At no time did the kingdom glitter more than when a new king was about to be crowned. The people of Benin called their king the Oba. They believed that he was a demigod, part god, part man. His ancestors were said to have been gods. The well-being of the entire kingdom depended on him. So when a new Oba came to the throne, his subjects spared no expense to put on the grandest spectacle ever. Few written records of the coronation ceremonies exist, but it is likely that the crowning of the great Oba called Ozulua happened in this way. For seven days before his coronation in about 1481 CE, the crown prince stayed in a special camp in Benin City, the capital. There he cleansed himself and prepared himself spiritually for the great responsibility of becoming Oba. Meanwhile, the kingdom feverishly got ready. People from the great sandy plains and the rainforest, people from all over the 250-mile-wide realm, sent gifts, baskets of yams, palm wine, cloth, elephant, elephant tusks, and bars of brass, a metal considered more precious than gold. Within the tall city walls, along the 100-foot-wide avenues, hundreds of craftspeople prepared the treasures that would be used in the ceremony. Brass swords of state that shimmered red gold in the sun, red cloth for the nobles, special beads, and jewelry for the royal family. On the day of the coronation, the crown prince made a grand procession to Use, a special village outside the capital. This was a rare event. Normally, the Oba did not show himself to his people. He was too sacred. But on this day, the crown prince rode on one of his best horses, which was decorated with bells. Young men ran down the streets ahead of him, blowing trumpets with deep, piercing tones. Then came three or four hundred nobles or chiefs, wearing red robes and brass ornaments. Around the crown prince, acrobats did flips and cartwheels. Musicians in leopard-skin skirts played their instruments. Little people and slaves marched by. Servants held the chains of tamed leopards, the symbol of the royal house. The procession stopped briefly at the village where the kingdom's first Oba had grown up. Here the crown prince chose his ruling title, Ozolua. Then he and all his attendants continued to the ancient palace first built for his ancestors, who were believed to be gods. There the crown prince went through complicated ceremonies. He symbolically bought the land of Benin from some of his chiefs who represented the people. Leopards and slaves were killed in his honor and offered to the gods. For the first time, he put on the royal crown and royal robes made of red coral beads. When Ozolua returned to Benin City and the royal palace there, he was no longer just a man. He had become divine. No ordinary mortal dared to look at him in the face as his procession went by. He now held the power of life and death over all the people, and the fate of the kingdom lay in his hands. A grand tradition. The details of Ozolua's coronation ceremonies had evolved over centuries. The people of Benin, who called themselves the Edo, or the Bini, didn't write down their traditions. They passed them on by word of mouth for hundreds of years, using their language, also called Edo. Their history was not recorded until European visitors began to write about Benin in the late 15th century. Thus, the dates of their history prior to 1500 are approximate. According to their oral tradition, the Edo people first settled on the west coast of Africa around 900 CE. They built high earthen walls around their villages. As the villages grew and the boundaries increased, so did the walls. 
Eventually, they formed an enormous complex web, hundreds of miles long. After a while, one of the village leaders dominated the others. He took the title of Ogiso, which means ruler of the sky. Despite his powerful sounding name, the Ogiso ruled with the consent of the other chiefs. The title of Ogiso was passed down from son to son. Tradition says that 31 Ogisos ruled, but many of their names have been lost and no one is really sure. Even so, the Ogisos are credited with introducing the royal throne and the swords of authority, as well as domestic tools like round leather fans, wooden plates, and mortars for grinding grain and spices. The last Ogiso, named Owodo, got into trouble because he could not have children. Only one of his wives had had a son, and his senior wife, who was jealous, had tricked him into banishing the young man. Finally, Owodo realized his mistake and asked his son to return, but he refused. Time passed, and still none of his other wives bore children. Perhaps this made Owodo crazy, because he, gradually he started to rule very badly. When he ordered the execution of a pregnant woman, the people rose up in anger. They banished Owodo as he had banished his son, and the childless ruler died miserably in a small distant village. Now the Edo had no king. They turned to a man named Avion, who was well respected because he had killed a monster that had been attacking the central market. Avion ran the government for several years, but when old age eventually caught up with him, Avion proposed that his son take over. The people resisted this idea. They said that Avion's son wasn't really an Ogiso. Everyone started arguing about what to do. The Test of the Seven Lice Finally, the people sent a messenger to the nearby kingdom of Ife. The messenger went to the king there, called the Oni. He asked the Oni to send one of his sons to be their ruler before things in Benin went from bad to worse. The Oni of Ife considered his, this request, and then said that he would give the Edo a test before he decided. The Oni sent the messenger back to Benin with seven lice, small white insect pests that live in human hair and animal fur. He told the Edo to care for the pests and return them in three years. The chiefs obeyed and put the lice in the hair of their slaves. After three years had gone by, the chiefs returned the lice, healthy and much fatter than they had been when they arrived. The Oni of Ife was pleased. He said that any people that could take such good care of common pests could certainly take care of his son. Around 1200, the Oni sent his son Oran Mian to be the ruler of Benin. Oran Mian set up his household in a palace that people had built for him. He married an Edo woman, and together they had a son. After several years in his new country, Oran Mian got very frustrated. He couldn't understand the Edo language and Edo ways of doing things. He finally decided that only someone raised in Benin from birth could rule over the Edo people. He gave up his throne and went home to Ife, leaving his son in the care of elders at the village of Use, not far from Benin City. The rule of Obas Around 1300 CE, that son became Ewika, the first Oba of Benin. Unlike the Ogisos, who had ruled as a group, the Oba was considered the supreme ruler. Tradition remembers Ewika's reign as long and glorious, but not many details survive. At first, the fact that the Oba was of foreign ancestry increased the power and mystery of the ruler. But as he became stronger, the Oba came into conflict with the chiefs. During the next 200 years or so, the Oba steadily gained more and more control. They introduced rules that highlighted their superiority and gave them more power over the chiefs. Oba Ewuare put on the coral crown about 1440 CE. After the original palace in Benin City was destroyed during a dispute with his brother, Ewuare built a new palace, widened the city streets, and surrounded it all with a new defensive wall and a moat. During his long reign, he introduced sweeping changes in the government, creating a new category of town chiefs comparable to modern governors. He traveled widely, conquering 200 towns and adding them to the Benin Empire. He is remembered as Ewu Are the Great. Shortly after Ewu Are died, about 1481 CE, Ozolua came to the throne. The kingdom expanded in all directions during his reign. He waged war upon a different town every six months or so. 
After a victory, he sent off one of his sons to rule the new areas and spread the idea of divine kingship. He became known as Ozolua the Conqueror, and the kingdom grew rich under him. This was not only because conquered villages sent taxes and tribute to the palace, it was also because traders from Portugal appeared on the Benin coast during his reign in 1486 CE. The Europeans first came in search of a shorter route to India, where they bought spices like pepper and cinnamon, but they found Benin a great source for pepper, as well as for cotton cloth, ivory, and slaves, so they kept coming back. They paid for a dough products with European cloth, coral beads, and brass rings. The Ado used the brass and coral to make religious statues and jewelry. As the trade continued, the kingdom of Benin grew even more wealthy and sophisticated. Some Ado princes learned to read, write, and speak Portuguese. When Portugal's king sent a representative to Benin, the Oba returned the honor by sending Ado princes to Portugal. Not long after the arrival of the Portuguese, around 1516, Christian missionaries also came to Benin. Benin's Golden Age The next hundred years or so were the period of Benin's greatest glory. At this time, Europe and Africa compared equally in technology. European visitors to Benin were impressed by the size of, Edo, of the Edo capital. They wrote that the streets of Benin City were longer and wider than those in most European cities. They described the Opus Palace as the grandest in West Africa, with large apartments linked by rows and columns decorated with brass plaques depicting military victories and religious pageants. Ozolua was followed by a series of Obas who made further conquests for Benin and added to the grandeur of the capital. Benin was securely situated. The central part of the kingdom was surrounded by a thick jungle of rainforest. Neighboring kingdoms posed little threat in any case. The Oba maintained an enormous army, at least 30,000 men, sometimes as many as 100,000. At that time, it was the largest military force in West Africa. People in other kingdoms trembled when they heard Benin was on the march. The Edo army made human sacrifices to the god of death before they went to war, and again when they came back in victory. People called Edo soldiers the children of death. Legend has it that people deserted their villages and ran into the bush when they heard the bells and drums of the Edo army approaching. Armed with spears, poisoned arrows, javelins, and swords, Edo chiefs and their soldiers ruled absolutely in an area smaller than most states in the United States, about 400 miles across. But the Oba's word was respected over a much larger region. The Kingdom Declines during the 17th century, Benin society began to decline. Arguments about who was to be the next king divided the country. Several bitter civil wars broke out. None of the seven Obas who ruled during this time did anything notable except to waste the kingdom's riches and anger the chiefs. A Brief Rebirth of Glory At the beginning of the 18th century, Oba Ewu Akpe came to the throne. Though his early reign was very difficult, he managed to restore the power of the Oba and the fortunes of his kingdom. His son, Akinzua, benefited from a revival of trade with the Europeans, this time with the Dutch. He became one of the wealthiest Obas ever to rule, and so did his son. Stories about Akinzua's son, Aaron Soyan, are still told. He had so many cowrie shells used as money by the Ado that he built a house and covered his floors and walls with the precious shells. Brass, that highly valued metal, fell from the sky during his reign. Although the authority of the Obas had been restored, this situation was only temporary. The kingdom's power began to weaken from the late 18th century and into the 19th century. Civil wars, probably caused by fights over succession, damaged the country's prosperity. The Obas retreated into their palaces. It was no longer safe to leave the capital for extended periods, because rebellious chiefs might try to take over the government. Some chiefs refused to pay taxes to the Oba. Revolts became common. European trade with Benin's vassals, however, continued to flourish. Unfortunately, this trade would eventually cause the near destruction of the kingdom. The beginning of the end. In late 1896, a British official named James Phillips decided that he wanted to visit the current ruler of Benin. Let's see, Opa Ovurame. 
Brame, okay. He wanted to complain that the Oba had not kept his part of a trading agreement made a few years earlier. Oba Overame sent word that it was not a good time. Important rituals were being performed, and the ruler could not meet with him. Phillips paid no attention to the Oba's message. Instead, he got together eight other Europeans and 240 Africans to carry supplies and gifts for the Oba. The group packed their guns away to show they were coming in peace. When they were in thick forest a few miles from Benin City, they were ambushed. Edo warriors attacked them, killing almost everyone. Only two of the Europeans escaped. It seems that the Oba did not order the attack and that it was carried out by a group of chiefs. This fact did not soften the anger of the British when news of the incident reached London. Newspaper headlines in London screamed that Benin was a city of blood. In part, the British made such a big deal of the raid because they wanted an excuse to invade. Benin and the Oba were the last African obstacles to a British colony in the Niger River area. The Oba surely knew that the British would strike back because of the Edo raid. Other powerful African kingdoms near Benin had already been defeated by the British, but the Edo kept hoping that the Oba's godlike powers would save them. They didn't. Several weeks after the raid in early 1897, a British force of 1,500 soldiers marched on Benin City and captured it. In what became known as the British Punitive Expedition, they blew up sections of the city. Fires destroyed a large part of the rest. British troops broke into the Oba's sacred palace. They stole all the Oba's precious art and treasure and shipped it back to London. Benin's treasure was sold to art dealers to pay the cost of the expedition. Oba Overamwe, the man who was a demigod, was forced to rub his head on the ground three times in front of the British and a large crowd of Edo people. The British put the Oba and his chiefs on trial. They executed two chiefs and banished the Oba from Benin for the rest of his life. It seemed that the great kingdom had ceased to exist. Benin had become part of the British Empire. Modern Benin in time, the British made changes to their colonial policies. They decided they could better control their empire by allowing native kings to rule. In 1914, the British governor of the colony of Nigeria crowned the eldest son of the deposed Oba and restored the royal coral beads to him. The new Oba of Benin took the title of the very first Oba, Eweka. Calling himself Eweka II, he said he was starting a new era for Benin. He rebuilt the palace and restored the titles of the chiefs. He ordered artists to make brass and ivory objects to begin replacing the ones stolen by the British. He restored the royal altars and began to perform state rituals again. His son, Akinzua II, who was crowned in 1933, continued these efforts. Today, Ewika II's grandson rules Benin, now part of the independent nation of Nigeria. The current Oba's name is Ere Deora. Your. Though he wears modern eyeglasses, he carries on traditions that are at least 800 years old. Benin was the first kingdom to rise in the forests of West Africa. It, was known, it has known both glory and suffering. Many ancient kingdoms, like the Incas of Peru and Aztecs of Mexico, have disappeared, leaving only impressive stone ruins. Some great civilizations, like those of Greece and China, have survived, but have changed so much that their founders would hardly recognize them. Benin, however, has endured. The culture, art, and government of centuries past survive to this day. So here's Oba Eridiora. I'm wearing a lot of the coral that we're going to read about, so it's really interesting. It's so heavy that he has to be supported. And this was the Kingdom of Benin circa 1600. You can see there's Benin City, and it stretched nearly to the Volta River in what's now Ghana. Let's continue. Kingdom of Brass and Ivory. Benin's culture, its art, music, stories, and ways of doing things revolved mainly around the king. Not only was the Oba their ruler, but he was believed to have control over the conditions that made a harvest plentiful or foreign trade profitable. The Oba is the center of prosperity, people said. Images of the Oba abounded. 
Metal sculptors created beautiful brass statues of the king, his family, and important chiefs. Artists carved images of the Oba's court on long elephant tusks and broad pieces of fine wood. Dancers and musicians gave special performances for the Oba and his court. The Oba himself played a central role in most of the rituals that punctuated the Edo year. Life on a Grand Scale Benin City, where the Oba made his home, was an impressive capital. A wall ten feet high surrounded it, forming a rough circle six miles around. Travelers approaching the city from the sandy coastal marshes or from the inland rainforests would first see the wall. Above it, they would see the tall, pointed towers of the city within, enormous brass birds perched on the tops of the towers. A huge brass snake slithered down one tower, beginning sixty or seventy feet up. The snake tower stood in the Opa's palace and represented his wealth. Like the viper who waits for his prey, the Oba waits for the people's tribute, the saying went. If the travelers were just visiting Bedin City, they were likely to be bringing tribute to the Oba or coming to trade. Like all capital cities, Benin City required an enormous amount of trade and tribute or taxes to keep it up. Thousands of buildings stood within the city walls, made of mud brick and roofed with tightly woven grasses and twigs. These buildings housed thousands upon thousands of people, government officials, craftsmen, priests, servants, court ladies, powerful chiefs. Most Edo were farmers, but few, if any, of these city dwellers tilled the land. They all depended on trade and tribute to live. Of course, the largest household was the Oba's. His palace had hundreds of rooms. Music and dancing filled its chambers. In the halls, ministers schemed to get more power for themselves. The Oba's special servants, who were given to him as babies, rushed around delivering messages and doing the king's errands. A dizzying number of officials went about their jobs. The master of the Oba's wardrobe, the recorder of deaths, the keepers of the Oba's harem, and on and on. The Oba had hundreds of wives and children who lived in the harem, located in a special part of the palace. Only one entrance led to the harem, and guards watched over it. Dressing in Royal Finery It is hot most of the year in Benin, so the clothes people wore seemed simple by modern standards. The women wrapped large pieces of cloth around themselves, the way people today might wrap themselves in a towel after a shower. The men wore smaller pieces of cloth that looked somewhat like modern skirts. These clothes were airy and cool. The Oba's courtiers wore cloth of the finest cotton, woven with patterns representing the Oba and certain sacred objects. For special occasions, the chief wore a special red flannel called Ododo. To an Edo, the most obvious signs of wealth and power were a person's coral, ornaments, and jewelry. Coral feels like a stone, but is actually formed by the hardened skeletons of tiny sea creatures. When taken out of the sea and polished, most coral becomes a shiny reddish pink. It can be cut and shaped into beads and other kinds of finery. The Edo believed that one of the great Obas had defeated the sea god in a wrestling match and had stolen his coral beads. Therefore, all coral was the Oba's property. It was sacred beyond price. The only coral found outside the palace came in gifts from the Oba himself. The Oba would give coral to people who pleased him. His wives wore patterns of coral beads in their hair, stringing them into braids, and then arranging the braids in small circlets. They wore high hairdos held in place with coral-topped pins. The wives almost covered their chest with coral necklaces. The Oba awarded coral necklaces to his officials. Receiving such a strand of coral was an honor equal to receiving a knighthood in European courts. When a chief was promoted to run a province or district, the Oba sent special officials to bestow the honor of beads. No chief would, could ever misplace the coral he received in that ceremony. He would be executed if he lost it. No chief dared appear before the Oba without his coral necklace. After the chief died, his family had to return the coral beads to the Oba. A year of holidays. The business of Benin City was more than looking grand and receiving tribute, however. The Edo believed that the actions of the Oba controlled the welfare of the entire kingdom. Each year, the Oba and his court led a series of sacred rituals. 
these ceremonies, the people believed, purified the kingdom and renewed the spiritual powers of the king. Many parts of each ceremony acted out religious ideas, past events, or political relationships. So the rituals also played an important role by bringing Edo religion, history, and politics to life. In the course of one year, the Oba and his court would spend several months participating in these pageants. They were a central part of Edo culture. A rite called Ugi Era Oba was one of the most important of the year. At this time, the Oba honored his ancestors on his father's side. In other words, all the Obas who had gone before him. He also emphasized his role as the supreme leader of the royal court and the nation. The ceremony took several days and had three parts. In the first part, the Oba led the court in recalling all of the past Obas. After an Oba died, an altar to his memory and spirit was built in the palace. The current Oba made offerings at each of these altars. The second part of the ceremony started the next day. All of the Oba's chiefs and officials lined up in order of their rank. The most powerful and senior went first, the most junior went last. One by one, these nobles paid homage to the Oba. In return, the Oba gave them gifts of palm wine and kola nuts, symbols of hospitality. The central ceremony, the most important part of Ugi era Oba, took place on the third day. On that day, the Oba spent several hours getting dressed. First, he put on a long cotton skirt or wrapper decorated with pictures of royal leopards and Obas. Then servants helped him put on another wrapper made of a net of coral beads. Then he attached a belt of coral beads. Around his neck, he wore a coral collar like a high coral turtleneck. His head supported a coral bead crown with tall projections. An ivory ornament on his belt and an ivory bracelet completed his attire. The sacred outfit weighed a lot. Imagine that all your clothes are made of small pebbles woven together and you get an idea of its weight. No matter how strong he was, the Oba needed help standing under all that heavy coral. Two attendants held each of the Oba's arms to help him walk. Dressed in all his finery and assisted by his attendants, the Oba appeared in public. Servants walked in front of him, clearing a path with magical bracelets. Others carried the Oba's Ada, a ceremonial sword that symbolized his power over life and death. Musicians blew horns and pounded drums. Women played rattles made of bead net stretched over gourds. The Oba walked through all this activity to the altar of his father, where he made sacrifices of palm wine and animals such as goats and chickens. Then the chief raised their ceremonial swords, called Iben, and danced around the Oba to the music of the horns and drums. The Oba then performed a similar dance before the altar of his father. The ritual ended with iron, a ceremony in which the chiefs reenacted an ancient challenge to the Oba's power, and the Oba defeated them. By the close of Ugi era Oba, the message was clear. The Oba reigned supreme, strengthening the Oba's spiritual powers. Another major holiday of the Edo year was Igwe, when the Edo celebrated the mystical powers of the Oba. Again, the festival had three parts. The first day, the chiefs greeted the Oba one by one. On the second day, rituals were performed to strengthen the Oba's spiritual power. Officials sacrificed a royal leopard and other animals, such as cows and sheep, to honor the Oba. Then they ground roots, seeds, and leaves into special potions. They applied these mixtures to the Oba's body to provide him with physical and spiritual strength. Four days later, all Edo men across the nation would honor their own igwe, or spiritual strength. On the day after this, children would run from their homes carrying torches to drive evil spirits away. They ran to the edge of the forest and returned bringing irere, or irere leaves, or leaves of joy. In the palace, the chiefs presented the oba with the leaves of joy. The leaves expressed the hope that the oba, his mystical powers renewed, would guide his people through a prosperous year. Nearly every day a holiday. In addition to these two important festivals, the Edo celebrated all sorts of other holidays and rituals. Isiokuo honored the god of iron and war. The Oba's warriors paraded through Benin City. Then acrobats hung by ropes from trees performed a mid-air dance to recall a mythical war against the sky. 
Priests sacrificed humans, usually slaves, as well as cows and other animals. Like many cultures that practiced human sacrifice, the Edo reserved these sacrifices for the most serious ceremonies, those involving war, fertility, or the oba. After the harvest, the oba performed a thanksgiving meal, egwe, making offerings of new yams at all the altars in the palace. Then people across the nation offered new yams at their home altars. At Ugi Ire, priests laid out the oba's beads and crown before the altar of Oba Ewu Are. Then, to strengthen the magical power of the beads, they sacrificed a man over the royal robes. Every other year, the Edo celebrated Egute, which they believed ensured healthy births around the nation. In the ritual, all the women were sent out of Benin City. Then priests and others dressed up like pregnant women, and a man was sacrificed. Not only did the Edo mark these major holidays, but they also had family rituals as well as ceremonies honoring local and state gods of all kinds. In Old Benin, almost every other day was a holiday. Art for the Oba's Sake Until modern times, most societies created art mainly to honor their gods. Ancient Egyptians carved statues and built temples for their gods. European Christians built soaring cathedrals and filled them with religious paintings, statues, and stained glass. The Maya of Central America built pyramids to honor their gods. In Benin also, a large part of the people's creativity was employed in producing works of art to honor the Oba and the gods. The complex rituals the, the Do celebrated demanded all sorts of things, statues and carvings for altars, sacred objects to use in ceremonies, special cloth for the Oba, the chiefs and the priests, musical compositions and dances for the various pageants. Making all this kept an entire district of Benin City busy. The Oba controlled the part of the capital where the craftsmen labored to turn metal, elephant tusks or ivory, wood and cloth into art. The Oba also controlled the trade in raw materials. For every elephant killed in Benin, the first ivory tusk to hit the ground went to the Oba. Likewise, the Oba regulated all the trade in metals and coral. The Edo believed that the things made from these materials were magic. So the Oba's command of the materials and the artists was an important source of his power. The Magic of Brass Throughout the world today, Benin is famous for the statues that decorated the Oba's palace and adorned the royal altars. Most were made of metal, the majority of a mixture of copper and zinc, brass, and the rest of a mixture of copper and tin, bronze. Without running scientific tests, today it is difficult to tell if the objects are brass or bronze. For the sake of simplicity, we'll use brass to describe all the metal statues. Brass polishes to a shiny reddish gold. The Edo thought it was beautiful and a little frightening, both qualities they linked to the Oba. Brass was very difficult to obtain in Benin. There were no copper mines in the nearby rainforests. At first, the Edo bought it at a high price from traders journeying from Nubia in modern-day Sudan. Later, after the 15th century, they traded slaves and spices to Europeans in return for brass. Unlike other peoples, the Edo had little interest in gold. Even the Oba possessed only a few gold ornaments. In Benin, brass was the thing. Heads above the crowd. This is what we're going to talk about next. These big brass Oba heads. The most sacred brass objects were statues of the Oba's head. This was because the Edo believed the head was the source of power, not only for the Oba, but for ordinary people as well. Tradition also held that the people of Benin had learned brass casting from a brass artist sent by the Ani of Ife, the same nearby ruler who sent his son to be the first Oba. In early times, it was said that after an Oba died, the people sent the Oba's head to the Oni of Ife. The Oni sent back a brass head to Benin City. After many years, the Edo asked the Oni to send someone to teach them brass casting. The Oni did. After this, with the death of each Oba, Edo artists fashioned a brass head of him. The cast heads are not individual portraits of the Obas. Rather, they are images of an ideal created to emphasize the king's godlike powers. The heads include the coral bead crown and high collar of the Oba's formal royal costume. No one has been able to determine exactly when each head was made. 
generally historians have concluded that the earlier heads are more simple and natural looking. The metal is also thinner in these early examples. As the centuries went by, the kingdom grew richer and brass became more plentiful. The later heads became thicker, more elaborate, and stylized. After the 16th century, the artists also began to fashion heads of the Oba's mother, the Queen Mother. She had her own palace and played an important role in the royal court. The brass statues show her wearing a crown with a forward-pointing peak that represents a high chicken's beak hairdo. Since only the Oba and the Oba's principal war chiefs normally wore crowns, the crowns on the Queen Mother figure show how important she was. The Edo believed that she could use supernatural powers to help her son. Other Treasures In addition to head portraits, the brass casters of Benin made many other objects. They crafted ceremonial swords and long staffs that rattled and summoned the spirits. They made brass bells and figurines of royal leopards and warriors. In the 16th and 17th centuries, they made hundreds of plaques or rectangular brass pieces that showed Edo festivals and historical events. In districts separated from the street of brass casters, other artists worked busily. A street of weavers created cotton cloth with pictures woven into it for chiefs to wear during ceremonies. They also made the chiefs hands of wealth, big hand cutouts made of cloth. Carvers crafted rattles, drums, and elephant tusk horns for musicians to play. They also shaped ivory and wood into statues, jewelry, boxes, and stools. They took elephant tusks and decorated them with rich patterns and figures that represented the stories of the kingdom. These carved ivory tusks were attached to the tops of the brass oba heads. The long projections they made stood for the oba's link between the world of the living and the spirit world of the dead. An altar for father. Many of these royal treasures ended up being placed at altars in the palace and in temples. Every oba prepared an altar for his father and had artists make objects for it. Each oba also prepared an altar dedicated to his own head or his destiny. He also had an altar to his hand and arm, the sources of his achievements in life. These altars were built on a semicircular platform made of hardened mud. Brass scenes of court life stood at the center, surrounded by brass heads and other objects. Rattle staffs, poles with rattles at the ends to scare away evil spirits, leaned against the wall at the back. These altars were the places to which the Oba came to make sacrifices and offerings during festivals like Igwe. Country Life In the towns and villages, chiefs and even ordinary people also constructed altars to their heads and hands and to their ancestors. These altars, of course, were much more simple. Instead of brass and ivory objects, the people placed objects made of wood, coconut shells, and gourds on their altars. Most things about life in the country were more modest than in the city. Outside Benin City, the Edo lived in several hundred villages, most with a population of four or five hundred. The rectangular houses faced onto one or two streets and cleared sandy spaces. The task of farming dominated most days. The farms were not connected to the village, and their location changed every year. Each year, villagers cleared new parts of the rainforest and planted one or two plots of yams and other vegetables. They worked three days and then took a day of rest. During their leisure hours, villagers spent most of their time talking. They had no television, radio, or video games, so they told one another stories about ghosts, about ancient wars and heroes, about the gods. They also played games. The adults played board games. Children played a version of the modern rock-scissors-paper schoolyard game. In it, one Edo child held his or her fist out to the other and said ta, which means guess. The other child had to guess how many dice the fist held. If he or she guessed correctly, the first child forfeited the dice. Edo girls played a lot of games that involved songs, the way modern girls do with jump ropes and hand-clapping games. Both boys and girls played rougher games, versions of Tug of War and Red Rover. Even as the villagers and country people went about their lives, they owed absolute obedience to their respective chiefs and to the Oba in Benin City. As any Edo would say, all the people, whether in the city or the country, were slaves to the Oba. The culture of brass and ivory was never far away. And 
our last chapter of the night. Gods, spirits, ghosts, and the Oba. In Benin, religion took a lot more effort than setting aside one day a week for worship. Spiritual life was complicated. It not only involved a supreme god and a world of the dead, but also a crowd of other lesser gods. As the Edo prayed and sacrificed and performed rituals honoring their many gods, they had several goals. First, they wanted to live prosperously and die leaving many children and grandchildren. Second, they wanted the kingdom and the Oba to be rich and powerful. Third, they wanted the gods to grant them favors. Overall, their religion praised life and the community. They prayed for things that would benefit family, village, and kingdom, rather than for things that would benefit them personally. How it all began. Like almost every other religion, Edo faith began with a story about how the world and the Benin kingdom came to be. This is the story. Long, long ago, the universe was just one big expanse of water, like an ocean with no end. Only a single tree, as lonely as a clam in its shell, broke the surface of the water. On top of the tree lived a long-beaked bird called Owanwan. One day, the supreme god, named Osanobua, decided to create the world. So he sent his three children down to the water, his daughter Obieve and his two sons Olukun and Ogiwu. As they were about to depart, the Owanwan bird in the lonely tree called out that the three should carry a snail shell with them. So they found a shell and then paddled to the middle of the watery waste. Then Obieve, the oldest, turned the snail shell upside down and out poured an endless stream of sand. The sand spread as far as the eye could see, and it became the land. Osanobua, the supreme god, divided the earth between his three children. He gave Obieve power or control over childbirth and agriculture. Olukun became the god of the sea. Ogiwu became the lord of death. The Edo believed that the world Osanobua had created was divided into two distinct parts the visible, physical world, and the spirit world. Normally, people couldn't see the spirit world, which was the home of the supreme god, lesser gods, souls of the dead and living, and demons and other supernatural beings. This invisible world was directly linked to the visible world. It could affect what happened in the physical world, and did. A lot of Edo worship was aimed at getting the spirits to do nice things instead of bad things. The gods the Edo worshipped may be divided into four types, personal gods, ancestor gods, the Oba, and gods above the Oba. Personal gods. The Ehi, a spiritual double. Personal gods were those who connected to an Edo's person or body. The center of every Edo's spiritual life was the Ehi. Each living person had an Ehi. In one sense, it was his or her destiny. In another sense, it was a person's other half, a spiritual double and guide. Each time a person was reborn, he had the same ehi. The Edo believed that a person and his ehi were joined in one life after another. Some said that a person and his ehi took turns being born on earth. In one life, the person was reborn, in the next, the ehi was. Before being born on earth, each person went to he before the supreme god Osanobua. To he meant to make a statement before Osanobua. The soon-to-be-born knelt down and explained what he wanted to do in his coming life, whether he wanted to be a farmer or a trader, a warrior or a carver, a thief or a chief. Then he asked the god for all the tools and talents needed to accomplish the plan. When the person finished, Osanobua banged a staff on the ground, setting his seal on these wishes. Then the person was born. The A he stayed behind in the spirit world to act as a guide and a contact with Osanobua. Success in life depended in part on keeping to the plan laid out before birth. A he is the way a person has to go, the people said. If, for example, a woman suffered or had continued misfortune, the Ado said that she did not he well, or that she had bad A he. When bad things happened, people made prayers and offerings to their ehis, asking them to intervene. After a stroke of good fortune, people thanked their ehis. However, being human, they were more likely to call upon them only in times of trouble. Use your head. A 
prosperous life demanded more than just a good plan. A person also had to rely on judgment, wisdom, and character. The Edo called this Uhumu, or head. The head was the seat of thinking, hearing, seeing, and speaking. A person's head led him or her through life. It was linked with luck or fortune. Depending on whether a person was successful or not, people might say that his head was good or that it was bad. The Edo blessed their heads annually, and when they wanted a particular favor, they first thanked their heads for survival and prosperity. Then they made their special request. This is part of the reason the Edo placed statues of heads on their altars. Men in particular stressed worship of the head. The welfare of an entire family depended on a man's head. His wives and children would suffer if his head were bad. Even further, the welfare of the entire kingdom depended on the Oba's head. The Ugi Era Oba festival honored the Oba's head and included human sacrifices to it. Lend a hand. The last of the personal gods was the hand or the arm. The hand represented the ability to accomplish things in the world. It symbolized vigor or strength and success in farming, trading, and any other activity. Warriors who lived or died by the strength and skill of their hands usually had altars to their hands. So did the Oba and particularly wealthy or successful chiefs who had grasped success through their own efforts. These shrines included a wooden platform carved with the design of clenched fists, meaning I have caught it. On top of the platform stood a statue of a hand with the fist clenched and thumb pointing up. Worshippers brought spears, shields, tools, or symbols of wealth such as padlocked chests and cowrie shells to the shrine. During some ceremonies, chiefs wore large cloth cutouts of hands. These were called hands of wealth. They showed that the chiefs had achieved wealth and power through their own efforts or hand. A modestly successful person would not have an altar to his hand. What has my hand done for me? A mid-level official might say. Someone who has failed might say, dejected, I have no hand. Witches, ghosts, and magic. After their personal deities had been honored and satisfied, people had to go to great lengths to keep the rest of the invisible world in line. At altars they offered food and colonets. They erected special shrines all over their houses. On their door beams and thresholds they attached charms for extra protection. The Edo fascination with ghosts and witchcraft was no greater than that in Europe and Asia during the same period. In 15th century Europe, people were constantly fooled by promises of miraculous cures, magic potions, and healing fragments of the true cross, which burning was common. At this time, the Chinese and the Japanese also believed in ghosts and magic. For the Edo, the spirits of the dead and their family ancestors provided the closest contact with the other world. After a person died and was buried properly, the Edo believed, the deceased made a hazardous trip across the waters that surrounded the earth. On the other side, the deceased entered the spirit world and tried to be accepted there. Once he or she became part of the spirit world, the deceased could interfere with the affairs of the living. The Edo spent a lot of time trying to please the dead in the hope that they would not play tricks on the living. This is an altar to a hand, apparently. The problem was that not every person who died was lucky enough to have children to bury him or her properly. If a man or woman died childless, he or she would be stuck in the world as a ghost. These were the phantoms people saw if they were foolish enough to go to their farms on a rest day. Understandably, the ghosts were angry at the living. Life had not been fair to them, so they tried to hurt the living whenever possible. They also tried to keep the spirits of the properly buried from making it safely to the spirit world. For this reason, the Edo threw scraps of food to the ghosts whenever they made sacrifices to their ancestors. Ghosts weren't the only dangers. Witches and sorcerers knew how to separate their life force from their bodies. In this way, they turned themselves into owls, cats, and dogs. They could also transform their victims into prey animals, like goats or antelope, and then slaughter them. Each village had a tree where witches were believed to meet at night and plan their murders. Aziza, the bearded and hairy god of the whirlwind, kidnapped those who wandered too far into the forest. Ugly monsters called elders of the night snatched people and carried them off. 
to protect themselves from these supernatural threats and other problems, the Hado turned to witch doctors and curing doctors. Witch doctors could fight witchcraft. They went to road junctions, believed to be places where the physical world and the invisible world intersected. There the witch doctors prepared medicines and made sacrifices intended to persuade the witches to stop their evil doings. Witch doctors also claimed to be able to identify witches. They would force suspected witches to undergo tests, snatching calories out of boiling palm oil, for instance, or forcing feathers through their tongues. Curing doctors tried to help the Ado with personal rather than supernatural problems. They were experts at preparing herbal potions to cure the sick. They also developed spiritual powers over many years. Sometimes they went into trances to carry messages to the spirit world. Other times they used fortune-telling methods to try to answer questions such as why a woman couldn't have children or whether her business would be a success. The King as Demigod when it came to personal gods, ghosts, witches, and spirits, every Yado had a slightly different religion. Whether a person sacrificed to his head or his hand, whether he prepared charms against ghosts, whether he suspected someone was using witchcraft against him, all these things depended on individual circumstances. If times were tough, a person might sacrifice to his ahi and call in the witch doctor. If times were good, he would thank his head and his hand, and have little use for doctors at all. But all Ado absolutely believed in this truth. The Oba was semi-divine, the closest thing to a god that they would ever see. The Oba was powerful and wise, fierce and noble. Some versions of the creation story even said that the Oba was the one of the three gods who helped create the earth. In these renderings of the tale, the Oba, not Obieve, the goddess of birth, was the one who upended the snail shell and poured out the sand that made the land. The Edo said that because he had created it, the Oba owned all the land in the world. Other kings were forced to come to the Oba and ask him for space in which to build their kingdoms. The Oba straddled the invisible world between the living and the gods. Through him, the gods channeled the powers that protected the Edo people. It was dangerous to look the Oba in the face, because the Oba had all sorts of magical powers. Unlike mortal men, the Edo believed, the Oba did not need to eat, sleep, or wash. The servants who waited on him in the palace could not talk about the Oba's physical life. The penalty was death for saying, or even hinting, that the Oba ate and slept. The Oba could not show any sign of human weakness. The Edo told many stories about the Obas, but one in particular makes clear how seriously the Edo took the Oba's power. In the 14th century, an Oba named Ohen was given the coral crown. Ohen had ruled the kingdom for about 25 years when he got sick and could no longer walk. He told his chiefs that he had been partly transformed into a mudfish, a sacred symbol of royal power. To hide the truth of his disability, Oba Ohen made sure that he was carried into the council chamber before anyone else. He also waited until all the chiefs had left before he had himself carried out again. One day one of the chiefs hid himself and discovered the Oba's secret. Furious, Ohen had the chief killed immediately. Gradually, though, the word got out that Oba Ohen was not a mudfish but a cripple. When the people learned the truth, they stoned Ohen to death. The moral of this story, the Oba and the kingdom were one and the same. If the Oba was weak, then the country might become weak as well. Ohen had revealed all too clearly that he was human, therefore he could no longer be the Oba. Gods above the Oba Even if the Oba was a god, he certainly was not the most powerful god. That honor fell to Osanobua, the creator of everything in the universe. The Edo pictured him as a king living in splendor with many wives and children. Legend has it that Oba Ewuare sent some of his close followers to visit Osanobua himself. In return, Osanobua visited Benin three times. The places where he appeared in the kingdom became the sites of the three major shrines to him. In general, though, Osanobua did not have a complex system of priests and temples to serve him. People believed Osanobua, or Osa, was everywhere. They prayed to him for general things, prosperity, good luck, victory. 
to ask for Osa's help, and Adele only had to look toward the sun or insert a branch into the sand and surround it with a few lumps of chalk and cowrie shells to form an altar. If they had requests for Osa, people had to make sacrifices at the altars. Osa only accepted sacrifices of animals. He particularly liked doves. The Edo actually worshipped Olukun, the god of the sea, with more fervor than they honored Osa. Perhaps this was because they believed that Olukun was the Oba's counterpart in the spirit world. The Oba owned the land. Olukun's name meant owner of the ocean. The Edo believed that the land of the living was surrounded by limitless water. This was Olukun's realm. All the rivers of the world, Olokun's wives, flowed into it. The Edo built a large temple to Olokun at Uronig Bay. There, there, priests and priestesses served him. Each year, the entire town put on a festival in his honor. Across the kingdom, every Edo household had an altar to the god. Worshippers rubbed themselves with white chalk, a symbol of purity. They prayed to Olokun for children and for wealth. Ogun, or Ogu, the god of iron, also commanded a large following. Legend said that Ogun used his machete, a large curved knife, to clear a pathway through the jungle when the gods first came to earth. Because of his skill with the machete, Ogun became the god of hunters, blacksmiths, butchers, barbers, and soldiers. In forges where blacksmiths made tools and horseshoes, altars to Ogun always occupied a central place. Hunters and warriors made sacrifices at their altars to Ogun before they went on their expeditions. When they returned, they placed the skulls of their victims in front of their Ogun shrines. The Edo said that a curse in Ogun's name was particularly effective. Ogun killed violently. Look at him. It does look a little frightening. In contrast, people turned to Osu, the god of medicine, for more gentle help. The people would make a shrine to Osu at a large tree deep in the forest. There, worshippers left big pots full of rainwater and leaves, the stuff of medicine. Bathing in the water from these pots strengthened a person for a difficult task or a long journey. It also protected against enemies in war. In most Edo households, the head of the family had a shrine to Osu in a special room where he kept his medicines. Obieve, the eldest daughter of Osanobua, originally oversaw childbirth, but her role in that area was gradually taken over by Olokun. No one, however, dared to challenge Ogiuwu, the god of death. When it was time to die, Ogiuwu came for people, sort of like the Grim Reaper. No images of Ogiuwu existed. No artist dared to draw the face of death. People worshipped Ogiuwu at his central shrine in Benin City, where they sacrificed human slaves before the army marched into battle. Chiefs and others sacrificed cows to the god, hoping to get him to delay calling for them. Edo everywhere feared Ogiuwu. They called him the merciless son of god who eats the colonet and doesn't spare the shell. Alright, that's going to be the end. Maybe I'll show you some of these pictures. Brass mask. A brass plaque for warriors. Isn't that so neat? A junior court official, it says, another brass plaque. So many brass sculptures. She's holding a leopard. An ivory spoon. This is a sculpture of a Portuguese soldier. And this chapter is about pretty much how the culture continues on today. Here's the Oba during the ceremony being held up by the attendants. And some acrobats. And this is a chief with this coral necklace. Oops. Ooh, an archaeologist, it looks like. Her coral crown. And some traditional healing. This is in Brazil, where a lot of the, the gods I mentioned are still worshipped cowrie shells. This is also in Brazil. Really interesting outfit there. And performing a dance to the God of Thunder. So that's the end of that for the night. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good